Well, the other thing, which I, I'm no legal scholar, but I've looked into this a little bit, and there is, and I'm, I'm sure you know more about this than I do, um, if you look back at the, there's, sometimes it's, there's a statement pointed to that free speech applies to all persons, and I did some research into where does that actually come from, and if you yes. look at the context of where that was, if you read it, you would, you can tell it's really referring to natural persons, right? Of People course, like me and absolutely. you, but it's being kind of now hijacked, I don't know what the it right is. word is, it to is. show that it was actually, you know, persons, corporations are persons too, but that wasn't the original intent of that. Yes, I mean, you know, James Madison said corporations are a necessary evil subject to proper limitations and guards. Thomas Jefferson said we shall crush in its birth the aristocracy of moneyed corporations. The framers understood the threat uh, of, the, of the corporation. In fact, the whole Tea Party, Boston Tea Party, that is, was really a response to corporate abuse. Uh, and I think that's really what we have to deal with uh, today. We're, we're not talking about, you know, a, 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 a matter that can be solved by some modest legislative reform. We're talking about a direct threat to our democracy over whether it's we the people or we the corporations that shall rule. Putting together two of the things we touched on, Scott Brown's victory and the Tea Party, I think Scott Brown's smartest decision since being elected was avoiding the Sarah Palin Tea Party thing in Boston. Am I right? Probably, yes. <laughs> I mean, that that and, and recognizing that he needs to be on, on the right side on certain things like financial reform, absolutely. Um, I recently sat down with Deval Patrick, the governor of Massachusetts, and he talked about how great the health care system is in Massachusetts, kind of in the context of how great what's been passed in Washington uh, is going to be. And he, I think he said, I don't know if it was 97.5 or 98.5% of Massachusetts, percent of Massachusetts residents have health insurance, and that based on that, he thinks it will translate very well the components that are similar to the national health care bill that's been passed. What do you think? Well, I think the problem here is that health care is a human right. It's, it's not a business. should not be treated as a business. Or a commodity. Or a commodity, exactly. And, and so long as we continue down this road in which we have a private market that determines whether or not people get health care, uh, we're going to continue to have many, many people without health care, and we're going to have people who ostensibly have health care insurance that don't have their needs met. And that's why a single-payer system is the critical way to go here. We've got to recognize that you know, if we're going to have real universal health care, uh, then it's a system in which health care is treated as a human right, not as a business. And I think when I talk to people from other states, one of the biggest misunderstandings, they say, well, Massachusetts, if you don't make whatever the minimum, the maximum you're allowed to make is you get free health care. And that's true. But it seems the problem is those people that make a little bit too much to get the free care, not enough to really be able to afford insurance and are choosing to pay the fine and still not have health care. I mean, that's really the critical I guess maybe where the Massachusetts system doesn't work as well? Well, that's right. And, and you know, and then there's the deductible issues and then all these other questions as to how people can afford uh, this or that kind of expense associated with health care. And, and the bottom line here is it shouldn't be about what you have in your pocket, whether you can afford to take care of your child who's sick or, or your mother or father who's sick or yourself. I mean, th this has to be a system that is equal and open to everyone, and it's guaranteed for everyone. That's what a single-payer system does, and that's why we've got to move in that direction. Last question. I was interviewed on a European radio show just over the weekend, and they were asking me, is it, do I think we may ever have a, a real single-payer system in the U.S.? And I wanted to say, yeah, I hope someday, but really I just feel that with the amount of influence that insurance companies, pharmaceutical companies have, both over you know, the general population and over those who make the decisions, I'm very skeptical that it could ever really happen, even in my lifetime. Am I right to be that skeptical? Well, I, I, I don't want to say your uh, skepticism isn't met with uh, some uh, rationality, but the fact is is that we have to fight f uh, forward on these matters, and ultimately I do believe we're going to see these kinds of changes. And that gets back to why we need to make sure we're amending the Constitution to take back our Constitution and our democracy uh, from the corporations. You know, corporations do have such an influence, just as you highlight with the health care debate, uh, over our society, over our government. And, and that's the core issue we've got to address. But, you know, until we get there, we're not going to really be able to solve all these other social justice, the economic justice concerns like health care, like the environment, like economic uh, questions of our time. We've, we've got to deal with controlling our democracy. So we have to keep trying, even if it doesn't seem likely in our individual lifetimes. 
we just have to you got to keep moving forward well my answer on the on the question of whether it seems likely is you know it, it, we, we can't change anything unless we imagine the change that's true um, and and that's that's the first order of business you know Doris Haddock Granny D uh, otherwise known recently passed away at the age of a hundred uh, in March of, of this year she as you know became famous in 1989 because she decided to walk across the country to overhaul our campaign finance system and she set out from California walking 10 miles a day sometimes cross country skiing not knowing where she's gonna be housed or fed random strangers all along the way housed and fed her. She made it to Washington, D.C. 14 months later, 3,200 miles later. She's an example of someone who stood up in an ordinary way and really changed the debate. But when she passed away, you know, I had the honor of knowing and working with her. When I, she passed away, I thought about the fact that when she was born, the 19th Amendment to the Constitution had not yet been in, even enacted, guaranteeing women the right, right to, to vote. vote. She saw in her lifetime nine amendments passed by the United States Congress, ratified by the states. She is an example. The change can happen, including constitutional amendments, and it happened in her lifetime, all of that. So I do believe we can make this change and happen in our lifetime. Well, if there's any better example than that of why we, it, you're absolutely right. If we don't even try, we know what the outcome will be. It just won't happen. Uh, we've been speaking with John Bonifaz, legal director of Bo Voter Action, also um, director of Free Speech for People at freespeechforpeople.org. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you so much. Midweek Politics is brought to you in part by Jackson & Connor, classically modern men's apparel in Northampton, Massachusetts, on the second floor of Thorns Marketplace. By DIF Design, specializing in custom business websites at difdesign.com. And by Shentrition.com, provider of all-natural superfood and adaptogenic herbal blend at Shentrition.com. To find out more about underwriting Midweek Politics, visit midweekpolitics.com.